It was a blowout win that we all needed to see from the Sacramento Kings, and I think it's safe to say now that they've figured some things out on the defensive end. I'll explain right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time, time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. I don't remember... I couldn't explain to you. I I could look it up statistically and and, and think back to like the 2006, 2005, 2004 Sacramento Kings that featured mainly run our tests. Like and like those are the days that I can point to vaguely about the last time that the the Sacramento Kings were consistently good defensively. And my memories from that time are, are, are very, very vague because I don't remember, again, I know they had good defensive players during that time, but I don't remember the day-to-day of what that defense looked like, what it took to be a good defensive team, where that identity comes from and how that identity translates on, an, on a daily or game-by-game basis. So the, the, the Kings being a consistently good defense, defensive team is a, a new concept to me. And let it be known, too, that we're not there yet, right? The Kings are not in the position yet where they can call themselves a consistently good defensive team, right? That being said, it really seems like they've figured something out. The perfect example I can give to you is this. In the last 15 games, the Kings have held their opponents under 100 points six times. Six times in the last 15 games, under 100 points. There, It would have been hard-pressed for the Kings in, in past years. In fact, I don't even know why I didn't think to do this. I, I should look it up. I can't remember how many times the Kings have held a team under 100 points. So I don't think they've held a team under 100 points six times in the last season or couple of seasons. Right? This team has figured out defensively how to have a regular presence. And that, to me, is the first step to be t- becoming an actual good to great defensive team. And, and the best thing is, right, it's not like they're holding the worst teams in the league under 100 points. It's not like they're holding only one or two teams that they keep playing over and over again to 100 points or under 100 points. They held the Bucks, the Knicks, the Raptors, the 76ers, the Clippers, and now the Nets to under 100 points. They only allowed 101 points to Boston the other night. Granted, it was in a loss, but still, defensively, this Kings team is figuring out how to not give up a boatload of points in uh, points in the modern NBA where scoring is at an absolute premium, right? Tonight, the Kings hold the Brooklyn Nets to 77 points. Now, granted, this is a Brooklyn Nets team that is decimated by injury or shutting players down for the rest of the season, tanking, whatever you want to call it, right? The Brooklyn Nets have nothing to play for, right? They're at the end of their season. It's been a bad year for them. They have questions going forward. Uh, so the this is a team that you would like to see the Kings dominate the way that Sacramento did. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit because, as we know, Sacramento has not always done the best job dominating in games that they're supposed to or that they need to. Right, They did so tonight. Great to see them win by 30 points, but the 77 is the number that really jumps out to me. And the fact that the Kings have held six teams in the last 15 games to under 100 points, six different teams, including teams that are are some of the best in the league. Right, A Milwaukee Bucks team, I know they're struggling right now and they've lost some questionable games since Doc Rivers has uh, taken over. That is not a team to like turn your nose up at. And they were completely healthy, right? They had Damian Lillard, who did absolutely nothing that night because of Keon Ellis. They had Giannis Antetokounmpo. They have, uh, of course, like Brooke Lopez and the different players on that Nets team, or excuse me, the Bucks team that you have to be concerned about. So what is different, right? Is it really as simple as the playoff physicality? 
Because that's the thing that we've heard Mike Brown and, and the Kings talk about a lot. And this pattern of good, consistent defense, it's not the first time in a limited stretch that we've seen the Kings do this. Go back to the playoffs. The playoffs last year, the Kings defensively were a whole lot better than all of us expected against the Golden State Warriors team that I believe was second in the league offensively to the Kings first at that time. So we know this team has been capable of playing somewhat consistent defense and having a a defensive presence. But is it really simply because officiating allows a ramped up physicality? Because if that's the case, then we have questions of, okay, that's great for the postseason, that's great for a playoff race, which to be fair is when it really matters most, but how do you get this for an 82-game season or close to an 82-game season, right? Because if the Kings had played the way defensively they've played since the month of March really began throughout the entire season, I don't think the Kings are in this position to begin with, right? This position of of fighting for for a play-in spot. If the Kings are this good defensively for the majority of the year, I think they're. it's safe to say they're a top six team. Now, I'm not going to go as far to say they're a top three or top four team like they were last season because of what we all believe to be the primary strength of the Sacramento Kings, which is the offense. It's good to see, and we've heard different players like Davion Mitchell, Harrison Barnes, they've talked about how much fun this team is having battling and fighting and playing physical every single night, which is great. I like that they're enjoying that instead of backing away from it because teams with ramped up physicality like the Knicks and like especially early in the season, the Houston Rockets, the the uh, uh, the New Orleans Pelicans. Those were teams that Sacramento really had a hard time with because they weren't ready or willing or able to match that physicality. Now the Kings are emphasizing the physicality. So it's great to see. But believe it or not, the defense has now made a reality clear to me of how unreliable isn't necessarily the right term. I think less reliable the offense is. And maybe this was a point of Mike Brown's, or this was Mike Brown's point all along, because he's been talking about going back to last season and training camp and the off season and, and, and this season. Like He's talked so much about like being a good offensive team is great, but you have to be able to play defense in the playoffs to actually win a championship, right? It, those offensive teams are fun, but they typically flame out in the playoffs because you don't want to have to score 120 points a, a game in order to win. We know the Kings are capable of scoring 120 points. And quite frankly, I think that at least pre-Monk and Herter injuries, they should have been scoring 120 points more recently than they have been. So I think, believe it or not, at this point, the question, the bigger question for Sacramento, assuming this defense is legitimate, the bigger question for Sacramento is what does the offense look like? Because even in a 30-point blowout, granted the Kings like shut down their, their starters, they didn't play the full game, right? The Kings only scored 107 points. Since Malik Monk went down, if we're including the Dallas Mavericks game, when Malik Monk went down, the Kings have had five super low-scoring quarters. uh, 13 points, which was tonight, their third quarter, when their starters were still playing. The Kings only scored 13 points in the third quarter. They had a 15-point quarter. They've had an 18-point quarter. They've had a 21-point quarter and a 22-point quarter by not just the King standards, by the modern NBA standards, those are super low scoring quarters. The Kings have had five of them in the handful of games since Malik Monk went down. So I'm what I'm not trying to do is I'm not trying to take this podcast after a positive defensive performance and a 30-point Kings win and, and make it a negative thing about the offense. I'm just pointing out, I think at this point, the bigger question to me, assuming this defense is legit and based off of what we've seen over the last month in the regular season it is, and I feel pretty confident about should the Kings make the postseason that this defense will hold up because they were able to do it last uh, year in the playoffs, right? So I think this defense is legit. It's not set in stone by any means and it's not good enough for this Kings team to lean wholly on to win a playoff series or hell, even make it out of the play-in at this point. But... If this defense is consistent, what's going to make the Kings a winner or a loser in my mind is how the offense fares with this defense, right? 
it can't be a the Kings only score 105 to 110 points maximum when their defense is this good every single night. Just like it can't be the Kings give up 115 plus points on nights where they're trying to score 120. Right? If you can find the balance of the two of them, a lot easier to say than to actually do. Certainly for me and my my position here on the couch. It's one thing for me to just look in the camera and go, hey Kings, why don't you score 120 points and then hold teams under 100? Oh wow, Matt, thanks. Wow, really, really tip-top stuff from you there. We'll just go and do that, right? I- I'm being I'm being real here. That, to me, is the bigger question. That's where we're at. At least, that's where I'm at with this Kings team right now. Is offensively, are you going to be able, especially without Malik Monk, are you going to be able to be versatile and dangerous enough to really pour it on and take advantage of this defense that has now found a way to semi-regularly, six out of the last 15 games, hold teams under 100 points? Now, I think they're 5-1 and one in those six games, the one being a loss to the New York Knicks. So that's a really, really good record. The Kings, quite honestly, should be winning every single game that they hold a team under 100. But that that's where I'm at. I'm very interested to see if this defense does carry out through the remainder of the season and into the postseason, whether it's the play-in or an actual NBA series, where's the offense at? Because to me, that still is always going to be how the Kings win or how they lose. The defense is great. The defense is very necessary. But offensively still, that's it's going to take you as far as it needs to go. And I understand Mike's willingness to sacrifice on offense to improve the defense. The defense has improved, but you can't sacrifice 10 to 15 points a game in order for the defense to be this much better and hope to make any kind of run. Because offense is still your strength. You look at this roster and it's still loaded with offensive weapons that need to step up more. That being said, tonight was a night we all needed. right? We all needed this game. Kings taking on the, the Brooklyn Nets with the exception of the Portland Trail Blazers game. Like, this is the easiest game that you're going to have. Easiest game of the road trip. You're already 0-2 during this four-game road trip. Back-to-back tough, tough losses. The Knicks, you blew a big lead. The Boston Celtics, you had that game and kind of fumbled it away. Well, that's not fair. You you made an epic comeback and had it and then kind of fumbled it away at the end. You had to take this game, right? Must win is an overused term in, in sports and in sports media and, and in podcasts and things like that. But in so many ways, like considering the playoff race and the play-in race and where the Kings were at, right? You you just, you had to win this game. There's just no, like I've said many times before, you've already burnt your safety net. You've already used your get-out-of-jail-free cards with your losses to Washington and Charlotte and Portland and uh, De- Detroit earlier this season, right? You had to go out and win this game. And the Kings have not always succeeded in doing that. But to not just win it, but to win it to win it comfortably, right? To take a big lead and really maintain a big lead. Not to say that the Nets didn't make their little pushes and at one point, like it was a 16-point game that the Nets quickly brought down to an 8-point game Then the Kings got it up into the 20s and the Nets went on a little bit of a run in the third quarter to get it back into the teens. Then the Kings ultimately slammed the door shut and, and win this game by 30 points, right? Like, I'm not saying that there weren't runs, but what we didn't have in this game is that sustained, long, painful run that opponents have been having against Sacramento far too many times this season, right? There wasn't one of those massive Nets runs that just undermines and negates all the good work that you've been doing. So that was really good to see. It was a wire-to-wire, essentially, win by Sacramento. They dominated. They took full control. The defense looked excellent. The offense, I thought the ball movement at times was really, really crisp and really solid. Some shots didn't fall as much as you would hope they would, and and had they fell, probably the Kings would have won this game by 40 or 50 plus and maybe would have flirted with that 120 number. There's things to be nitpicky about. Offensively, they were good to great, as they should be. Defensively, they were phenomenal, again against a weaker opponent, but that, that really doesn't matter to me. It really, truly doesn't, because those who have been paying attention, those who follow Kings basketball knows the Kings... Doing this against any opponent is always a good thing, but especially doing it against an opponent that they are, in theory, supposed to do it against, not trying to disrespect the Nets or their NBA players, right? But given the circumstances and the significance of this game, to have a stress-free, dominating performance, especially on the defensive end, 
to to see that the Kings didn't that they that they recognized the moment and still played with the physicality that you would expect them to play when they meet the Suns or when they meet the the Pelicans coming up here. They play with that level of physicality still as if this game was a big important game. But because of the opponent that they were facing, they used that to create and then maintain separation. We all needed it. It was a breath of fresh air. Now, I have three players in particular, three, three Kings players, that I want to talk more about. Demondis Sabonis, Keegan Murray, and Colby Jones. I'm looking forward to talking to the three of them. Plus, an update on the race in the play-in. The Kings got some help tonight. I'll explain in just a second. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by my good friends at Sack Yard Community Tap House, the first ever local sponsor of the Locked On Kings podcast, and it was the venue for our first ever live Locked On Kings podcast. I got to speak with Jerry Ren- Reynolds and Gary Gerald out on the patio at Sack Yard. It was an unbelievable experience. Thank you to all of you who came out to support the show, to meet Jerry, to meet G-Man, and, and listen to them talk Kings basketball. If you missed that show, the whole thing, unedited, is up for you right now on the Locked On Kings uh, YouTube channel, so you can go and watch the entire thing, watch that whole conversation conversation was a really, really cool, really, really fun time. Uh, but Sackyard is not just a place for you to go only when Locked On Kings are holding events, right? Any place or any time there's a Kings game on and you're not actually at the game itself, forget your couch at home. Go and watch it at Sackyard with your fellow Sacramento Kings fans. They have an amazing selection of draft beers for you to try. They're always cycling uh, new beers and ciders and great things in. Uh, they have amazing local wines for you to try as well. They have a brand new food truck that they own with some uh, delicious food out there for you as well. They host events all the time, including live music, games, and and things of that nature, an outdoor patio that's perfect year-round. They also encourage you to bring your family, not just your kids, not just your aunts and uncles and, and distant relatives. Bring your pets, bring your dogs. You'll find dogs there all the time at Sackyard. It is your home for the Locked on Kings listener. Locked on Kings is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over three million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball continue here in the month of April. Be the uh, or you can bet on all of the Prize Picks action, especially for the men's champ. Championship game coming up tomorrow. Get on that action uh, on Prize Picks. You can also get in on the NBA playoff action and win up to a hundred times your money on Prize Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Prize Picks offers just incredible different things from different promotions to one of my favorite things. It's their injury like forgiveness or injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For example, when Kevin Herter got er- injured earlier this season, he was one of my prize pick selections. I didn't lose because Kevin was out. It just got voided. It just got pushed. And all my other prize picks, the, the pay scale was adjusted, but all my other picks, it didn't count against me, right? I ended up winning that night because of this insurance policy that's in place. And you'll, you won't find this anywhere else. Go and Download the app today and use code Locked On NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. I've been getting on Demonte Sabonis more recently than I have all season long. Those of you who maybe haven't listened to the last few episodes are going, Matt, what the hell are you talking about? You're like the biggest Demonte Sabonis homer out there. You're so obnoxious talking positive about Sabonis at this point. You're right, but. His performances in recent games, especially with Malik Monk being out, it simply has not been good enough. And I have had no problem pointing that out. I think Demonte Sabonis would tell you the same thing, right? Offensively, as great as his double-double streak has continued and he was grabbing big rebounds and doing what he does on that sense, but offensively, scoring-wise, he still wasn't doing what I needed from him. Tonight, 18 points, 7 of 14 from the field, 20 rebounds, 9 assists, 1 steal, 2 blocks. I love those all alternate stats, 61 straight double-doubles now, which is just crazy. That's his 8th game this season with 20 or more rebounds. So we know how dominant Sabonis is on the gra- glass. Now, 14 field goals to me is around the minimum sweet spot for how many field goal attempts I want Sabonis to, to shoot a game. But I was watching and paying attention, and... I think a lot of Kings fans have picked up on this over the course of the season, and it feels like it's happening more recently, maybe because we're all talking about it and seeing it more. And it dawned on me, right? Like, 
DeMontis Sabonis doesn't have to score or, or, or is not going to become the scorer of 20 points a game every single night, even though that's close to his average. Or let's say like he's not going to eclipse 25 points on a regular basis by suddenly shooting and knocking down mid-range jumpers and threes. Would that help his game and help the Kings overall? 100%. But we have to be realistic as to what type of player he is. Sabonis, it feels like, and again, maybe we're just more hypersensitive to this now because we're paying attention to it. It feels like Sabonis misses a lot of bunnies around the rim. Now, again, it's one of those things that's easy for me to say because Sabonis gets hit in the in the face at least once a game, feels like two to three times every single game. He's constantly battling in the paint. Every time he has the ball in his hands and he touches the paint, he gets double or triple teams, teamed with guys swiping at him. Hell, that's how he broke his thumb last season was uh, a swipe that hit him on the thumb. That's how uh, a swipe is how Kevin Herter dislocated and tore his shoulder. So it's, again, easy for me to say, hey, just finish your shots around the rim more. But there are two to three, I'm not going to say all 14 of his field goal attempts were bunnies around the rim and he only made half of them. But at least two or three of the misses tonight were shots that, in theory, more often than not, you should be making. And that to me is where, okay, we want to get Sabonis to that 23 to 25 points a night. If he cleans up those bunnies in addition to the the typical scoring that he does, because he had a lot of really good moves tonight. He had a couple of instances where where he didn't wait, like he'd get the ball in the high pl- a block or in the high post, and he'd immediately put the ball on the ground and go to the rim and, and, and try and score at the rim. He was definitely attack-minded looking to score at different times in this game, which is nice to see considering he's such a pass-first big. But the Kings need that out of him right now with Monk and with Herter out. But cleaning up those bunnies around the rim, that's where I think Sabonis' next level of offense or scoring, I should say, consistent scoring in the points that he puts up, that's where it comes from. So we'll keep an eye on that. That Keegan Murray tonight, 19 points, 7 of 18 from the field, 6 rebounds, 4 assists, 4 blocks. That's a career high for Keegan in blocks tonight. He was fantastic, a big reason why the Kings had such a great defensive night, and he continues to make those strides defensively all season long. That That's really been his primary growth. That being said, talked about this a lot too since Malik Monk went down. Like The Kings have needed Keegan to be more of a volume offensive impact player since Monk went down, and he's answered that call. Right, He stepped up and he's embraced that. 18 field goal attempts tonight, got no problem with it. Now, I think he went 3 of 10 from three-point range, so he wasn't afraid to let it fly from the perimeter as well, which that's a strong suit of his. Absolutely keep letting him fly. I have no problem with him going 3 of 10. Like, keep shooting him, Keegan. And I think as much as we just talked about Sabonis needing to step up and and taking that next step with the bunnies around the rim of becoming like a everyday 20-plus point-per-game score and, and getting into those 23 to 25 games every once in a while, I think Keegan... For the Kings to be successful, if we're going back to the conversation that we had at the beginning of the the podcast about offensively, what is this going to look like with the improved defense and how can the offense continue to carry this team to a hopefully deep playoff run, I think it's going to require Keegan to be the second best scorer on this team, which is a role that Malik Monk has owned all season, right? Malik Monk has been the second go-to scoring option for Sacramento, period. It hasn't been even remotely close. Doesn't mean he's the second best player. I'd say Malik Monk has been consistently the third best player on this Kings team with Fox and Sabonis at one and two. But Keegan now needs to step into that responsibility and that role of you need a bucket and you need someone not named De'Aaron Fox to get you a bucket. Keegan, you're the first guy that we all look to. That doesn't mean it's all on his shoulders, but the success of Sacramento offensively these 115 to 120 point games that we still want to see from time to time because again when the kings score 120 or more their their win percentage is like over 90 it's ridiculous to me it's going to start with keegan now that doesn't mean if he has cold nights that the kings are screwed because different guys have been stepping up. Davion Mitchell's been shooting really, really well. The Kings bench in general played really well tonight. I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, Keon Ellis has been knocking down threes. Trey Lyles off the bench, right? Harrison Barnes, who's been struggling recently, but Barnes is capable of, of giving you some offense. So it's not all on Keegan, but he's the first guy that I'm looking to that's not wearing number five on the Kings 
to start and go and get you uh, the, that consistent scoring. And it looks like that's a that is a conversation that's happening within the Sacramento Kings organization based off of how aggressive Keegan has been in these games now where he's more often than not putting 15-plus shot attempts up a night, which is exactly what you want to see. I want Keegan to be the second-leading scorer for Sacramento. I also want to see him take the second-most shots a night for Sacramento. That's what he's doing since Malik Monk uh, went down with his injury. Finally, I want to talk about Colby Jones. Colby Jones tonight, man. He earned this opportunity for extended playing time based off of how he played in the uh, the Boston game with that Kings comeback in Boston. Colby Jones, seven points, four rebounds, four assists, three steals, two blocks. What a freaking stat line for the rookie. Love what Colby Jones brought you. And my main takeaway from watching Colby Jones play, this guy's an NBA player. Right? He, he's got the size. He's got the athleticism. He's got the look. Like Colby Jones, he, he makes great decisions. He's smooth with the basketball. He's smart with the basketball. Like, Colby Jones just, I look at him and it screams NBA player. It also screams rookie on a team with playoff aspirations, meaning it's very difficult for you to get an opportunity. Like, unless you're a top five pick like Keegan Murray was last year, like, it is very difficult for a player like Colby Jones, who again was a second round pick. The Kings moved up in the second round to get him. Like, it is very difficult for Colby to break his way in, which is why we haven't really seen him much this season or seen him with any kind of consistency this season. But here's an opportunity where he got extended minutes. Mike Brown rewarded him, and he continued to play well. After the stat line that Colby put up, I don't know what the plan is early for the Oklahoma City Thunder on Tuesday, but in my mind, Colby Jones got to play. He's got to be out there to see if you can keep building on this. I'm very excited to watch how Colby continues to develop and specifically how his role develops because he's had huge games in the G League this season. He's got an outside shot. He's a great facilitator, great floor general. He's got the size and the length to be like an an oversized guard. That's kind of the, the, the role that he had at Xavier. Like he is a NBA player, in my opinion. So how will his role develop? What does it look like next season? Now we have to go through an offseason and, and we have to look at what this roster looks like to determine that. But in my mind, Colby Jones is absolutely a role player in the NBA. And it's just because he's a rookie on a good team that, like, if if Colby Jones were in Charlotte or Detroit or any of these other, like, he'd be playing 15 to 20 minutes a night. I'm pretty confident in that. But I'm sure he'd much rather be in the situation that he is right now. But look at him go. Like, it's, it's, it's it's a small sample size, right? So I'm not ready to go, yep, Colby should be playing every single night. He's an NBA player. Mark my words. He should take the the minutes of, Chris Duarte, or take the minutes of whoever, Sasha Vizenkov. Like, no, I'm not there yet. But when a player shows you what they can do at the G League level, that's a sign of being an NBA player. And then when you play him in any NBA game, regardless of the competition, and he provides the stat line, again, seven points, four rebounds, four assists, three steals, two blocks. Doesn't matter that he didn't do great in one particular area, although three steals and two blocks is great. What the hell am I talking about? But he was... All over this game, right? He had his fingers in every ass, uh, facet of this game. So that's what you need to see out of an NBA player taking advantage of those opportunities. And I'm very excited to see what Colby Jones's future looks like, hopefully in Sacramento, but in the NBA period. Locked on Kings is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for small businesses, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the tools to help find the right professionals for your team uh, faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place for you to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many qualified candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a lot of hats and might not have the time or the resources to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make that process easy easier. They even have launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making that process even easier and quicker. Two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Depending upon how you look at it, 
the New Orleans Pelicans did the Sacramento Kings a favor tonight. They beat the Suns 113-105. to Now, no matter what, somebody had to lose this game, which was going to be a good thing for Sacramento, especially if Sacramento did their job, which they did, and win. But the Pelicans beating the Suns helps in, in, in two ways. Number one, it brings everybody closer together. So instead of the Suns winning and pulling every, like a, a little bit further away, meaning the Kings essentially only have the Pelicans to catch, that it's better to have options, especially when you're facing each of those teams one more time this season in your final four games. Right? It's crazy. We only have four games left. Two of them are against the two teams that are directly ahead of you. In so many ways, like you want to control your future, it's, it's almost as good as you can ask for. So there's that side of things, and there's also the side of my question that I'm posing to you. Which team would you rather have? We're talking about, let's assume the Kings hold on to the 8th spot, right? Or maybe they can even move up to 7, but they're they're in that 7-8 play-in spot. Would you rather have a one-game playoff against the Phoenix Suns or a one-game playoff against the New Orleans Pelicans? Now, I think most of you are going to do what I initially did, which is go Suns 100%, based off of how the Kings have played the Suns so far this season, and I'd understand that. Right? The Kings have played the Suns, even in their losses, have played the Suns a whole hell of a lot better than they played the Pelicans in the four games that they've played, and they've gotten their asses handed to them basically every single time. Right, The Kings have been destroyed by New Orleans this season. Here's the but that I pose to you. It might not matter enough for you to change your mind, but ponder this. Think about this for a second. One game playoffs. It's essentially a game seven. Right? We saw firsthand how stars rise to the occasion. Look what Steph Curry did in Game 7 to Sacramento, scoring 50 points last year. You might want to forget it. I'm not going to let you forget it for this specific instance, right? Because you're looking at a Suns team that has Kevin Durant. He can go for 50 on you. Devin Booker, he can go for 50 on you. Bradley Beal, he can go for 50 on you. Any one of those guys or a combination of those guys can have big nights that kill you. You look over at the New Orleans Pelicans, there are no scrubs, right? Brandon Ingram, terrifying to Kings fans. Zion Williamson, who the hell on Sacramento can stop that man? There there are players on the Pelicans side too that should scare you as offensive weapons. But Durant, is, uh, I think out of all those players that I just listed, Durant is the one to fear more than anybody else because of his experience and because of the fact that in these just one-game playoffs, he's one of those guys, that, and Booker can do this too. Any of these guys can do it, but Durant is that guy where it would not shock me at all if you were to tell me, yeah, in a one-game playoff, Kings versus Suns, Kevin Durant went for 50 and just put the Suns on his back and there's nothing the Kings could do about it. So, is that enough for you to go, maybe I'd rather have the Pelicans because they don't have those stars. I don't know if this influences your decision at all. I'm not there. I would much rather play the Phoenix Suns than play the New Orleans Pelicans because I trust the Kings better. I think the Kings match up much better against the Phoenix Suns, even without Malik Monk. So I'm I'm taking that. And I guess we'll see because, again, the Kings play both these teams coming up. Maybe the Kings play really well against the Pelicans and really crappy against the Suns, and I changed my mind on that. But for those of us who want the Kings to play the Suns and not the Pelicans, this was a really, really good night with the Pelicans beating Phoenix 113-105. to 105. And then, shout out the T-Wolves. Thank you, Anthony Edwards and company. They beat the Los Angeles Lakers tonight. So that means the Kings now have half a game of cushion over the Los Angeles Lakers in that ninth spot. Really, it's like a game and a half because the Kings own the tiebreaker against the Lakers because they swept the Lakers in this season series. So, Pelican, uh, sorry, the, the Timberwolves did the Kings a big favor tonight by beating the Lakers and giving them ever so slightly a little bit more breathing room. So the Kings are still on that cliff edge of the 8-9 to nine drop, and I've explained before, and I'll sum it up really quick. 7-8, to eight, way better than 8-9. to nine, uh, Sorry, 7-8, to eight, way better than 9-10 and 10 in the play-in because 7-8, and eight, you only have to win once and you're in. 9-10, and 10, you have to win twice and you're in. If you lose at any point in a 9 or 10 spot, you're out, period. And in 9 or 10, you can only win the 8th seed. You can't win the 7th seed like you can in 7 or 8. So, much better spot to be in an 8 than 9. The Kings are still on that edge, right? They're still teetering, but they're not necessarily looking straight down like they were a night or two ago when the Lakers and Kings were were dead even, or even at the start of today. So, better situation for Sacramento, to say the least. Now they have the Oklahoma City Thunder on 
Tuesday. Another massive game for both teams, right? The Kings, if they can beat the Thunder, go 2-2 two two on this road trip with three games remaining going into that doubleheader against the Pelicans and Suns, feeling pretty good. That would be awesome. But the Thunder, not only are they no pushovers because they're number three in the West right now, the Thunder are a game back, as of tonight, they're a game back of both second and first place. So, no matter what, they're going to have home court advantage in the opening series. But if the Thunder expect to go as deep as their record suggests that they could go, they obviously want to secure home court advantage as much as they possibly can. So I fully expect the Thunder are going to be all in on trying to win that game. I know they battled some injuries recently. Who knows if that helps or hurts Sacramento at this point. So we'll see what kind of team they field come Tuesday. But the Pelicans are certainly going to be, sorry, the Thunder are certainly going to be battling to win that game. So it's not going to be a situation where, oh, it's end of the season. They know they're going to be a playoff team. They're going to shut it down and rest. I wouldn't expect that at all from a Kings perspective. Love to hear your thoughts on tonight's game now. Love to hear your thoughts on that Suns or Pelicans debate. Who would you rather face in the play-in? Plenty of, uh, of, of time still to share that with me. You can hit me up on Twitter at MattGeorgeSack. You can email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below as well. Appreciate your support here of the Locked on Kings podcast. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.